Okay, hey guys, um, here's uh, the chapter 17 presentation for you all. I'll give you guys a little bit of a background knowledge and presentation on all things chapter 17, which is, as you can see from the title, Nomadic Empires and Eurasian Integration. Um, now, this chapter deals heavily with nomadic pastoralists, and hopefully you remember from your previous schooling and earlier this year that nomadic means you move around a lot. And if you're a pastoralist, that means usually you're bringing animals with you. So there's going to be a lot of herding of animals going along with this. But we are talking a lot about Mongolians um, and other people that are very similar to them. More often than not, when we think of Mongolians, we think of images like this. Now, this is after a battle with um, Russian resistance when the Mongolians were making their forays into Eastern Europe. And one of the issues that Mongolians were very famous for is their brutality. And we see in this picture, on one particular occasion, they took a bunch of Russian nobles that they had recently defeated. They had taken the door to their city off and they actually placed it on top of the Russian nobles themselves and proceeded to dine and party on top of them the whole night long. Um, and probably all sorts of other awful things too, as they slowly suffocated, listening to the sounds of their enemies literally dance on top of them. This is oftentimes the element of the Mongolians that's very much portrayed in um, media that you will see often because it's interesting. People like to see it, but it's very easy to think of the Mongolians as a bunch of bloodthirsty, brutal savages. And in many ways they were, but they actually had a lot more to them than that. They're actually a very complex society in many ways and actually a, a much more successful civilization than many of the contemporary societies that we saw around them. But what we need to know about just not only Mongolians, but also these Turkic, as in people from Turkey societies, is kind of where they came from. They came from Central Asia, in which there really wasn't enough rainfall or conditions to have large-scale agriculture. Um, so as a consequence, they herded animals. They basically traveled around, had um, impermanent shelters that are called yurts. They're basically these circular structures that are like tent cities more or less and they went around and they followed various migratory patterns that allowed their animals to pasture as much as they could they might have cultivated some crops on a very small scale but nothing to the large degree of say an agricultural sedentary society um they had a little bit of pottery a few leather goods not a ton in the way of weapons and tools that is until they started expanding and basically a, a rather desperate existence for for many of these types of people they lived in central asia but they would eventually especially under the power of the mongols spread their influence all throughout eurasia and amass for themselves one of the largest empires the world has ever seen the largest empire the world had seen up into that point and as we continue on keep in mind other empire builders and sort of notice similarities and differences like i always say in this class where you really start to have to having to do is make these comparisons because that's one of the things that's going to ask you to do over and over and over again when you have to take the test so these are the sort of people we're dealing with um if you were to encounter a mongolian from uh, Genghis, Khan, Gen Genghis Khan's time, you would probably not be terribly impressed. They, one would probably smell awful, but most people back then smelled awful. People didn't bathe very regularly, and they probably smelled like the animals with which they were around most of the time. Um, they were probably very dirty country people. They probably spit and went to the bathroom wherever, and um, it wouldn't be that pleasant for a modern day person living in the United States to have to deal with, but um, they would be essentially the conquerors of Eurasia. Probably could have even gotten further um, had it not been for certain circumstances. But let's get into sort of what these people were able to do. Um, they were able to create links between the nomadic and the settled. Um, nomadic and settled people used these sort of nomadic pastoralists to engage in this sort of 
long distance travel because they were good at it. They were the ones who would protect the caravan routes and the various Silk Road networks that allowed Eurasia to basically continue to engage in at least some sort of trade after the fall of various empires, whether they be Roman, Byzantine, um, the Delhi Sultanate, um, the rise and fall of Umayyad and Abbasid, um, Islamic dynasties, and so forth. Um, so their society in which they lived um, is kind of a reason for their success. Now, they were clan-based, and what that means is they had a lot of like smaller little societies within themselves and if you were to be a successful leader of these groups you had to unite the clans either through marriage or through conquest or through some sort of political trading um not too dissimilar to what we saw in china with the warring states except on a smaller scale at least at first if you were a charismatic and capable leader you could become an elite leader and assert authority over these various clans um however the status for the higher-ups in Mongolian society and Turkic societies was very fluid, meaning you could have the whole world at the tip of your fingers one day and then all of a sudden lose favor and literally lose everything. If a ruling family was seen as incompetent, not only would the leader be killed, but their family would have everything taken from them. So the pressure and impetus to stay at the top and keep your... Um, various systems working was very much a necessity. If you didn't do it, you would lose everything. You didn't really have a safety net to fall back on. We'll see that's actually happened with uh, what happened to Genghis Khan. And on the same token, it was actually a lot of opportunity for common people within these societies to advance up and be able to take control if they showed capability in doing so. And also, in terms of gender relation, it was much more egalitarian than their contemporary sedentary agricultural counterparts. Um, women within Mongolian society had to be very tough. They're traveling all over the time, all over the place, having to be pregnant on horseback for much of the time. And they're spending a lot of time in close quarters with their male counterparts. Because of that, they were given a lot more power and freedom within these societies. They had the opportunity to get remarried, they could get divorced if they wanted to, and they oftentimes served as key advisors to um, male figureheads. Now, don't think that women were truly egalitarian because they weren't, but they did have a lot of capabilities within this. Um, they were less patriarchal than other, but it was still a male-dominated society. In terms of religion, they were shamanistic in terms of they had sort of, um, in the, the sort of unfair term would be like witch doctors, um, but it would be like shamans, people who believed in sort of a nature element of religion. However, they would later adopt elements of Buddhism, um, Nestorian Christianity, which is sort of the Christianity that was popular in Persia at the time, Islam, Manichaeism, um, and other religions of the time um, during during this period. They loved to adopt other cultures. In terms of providing their own culture, they didn't really do a ton of that, but they liked to sort of appropriate other culture. Um, the Turkish nomads did develop a script which was primarily used to record their religious teaching. Um, and the Turkish nomads would um, adhere to Islam much in a much greater frequency than the, their Mongolian counterparts, especially due to the Abbasid influence, which was much more about um, learning and teaching um, through various universities. Think of like the madrasas and whatnot from uh, Unit 3. Big reason for the Mongolian and Turkic nomadic success, especially the Mongols, was their organization and their execution militarily. Um, they had a very strict hierarchy in terms of military. Um, tribal elders called the shots, and the way their military worked was all horses, all speed, all the time. If the Mongolian army was, you know, a, a sports team. They would be the fastest team you've ever seen. Um, one of my favorite ways to put it, if you look down here to the left, if you play chess with a Mongolian, um, they're only going to have uh, um, knights, just just knights all over the place. Just That's it, just horses coming at you. They were very fast and they were very mobile. They could come, the army could be upon your army in a heartbeat. Um, you have to realize most armies back then, they only traveled by either horse or 
by foot. Mongolians only traveled by horse. They were exceptionally good horsemen. They were the best horsemen the world had ever seen. Some may even argue the best horsemen ever. Um, Mongolian children started riding horses about as soon as they could walk. They played games in which involved riding horses. Um, and Mongolians were one of the first societies to employ the use of stirrups, which, as you see here, are basically a means of being able to stand while mounted on one's horse. And this is very, very effective for one of their most common means of attack, which is uh, the use of bow and arrow on horseback. The Mongolians were masters at being able to find the rhythm of a horse while riding it, and then when all four of the horse's hooves hit the ground, that's when the horse is the most stable, and that's when they would fire their arrow, and they were remarkably accurate with this. So they were a very fast, difficult target to hit because they were moving all the time, and they could hit you with an arrow. And they had a special way they liked to attack. They liked to lure armies into fighting them, and then the Mongolians would retreat. Then as the Mongolians are retreating on horseback, they're firing backwards with arrows at their pursuers who are just getting picked off and weakened and weakened and weakened. And then the Mongolians usually then turn around with many reinforcements to overwhelm their enemy and, and then it's over. Then they start throwing doors on top of people and partying on top of them until they suffocate and die. And due to this, they drew huge empires. Um, we see that here the Turkic empire the turkic people started here with very 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 small meager um territory holdings but eventually they would expand um overtaking much of the not all but much of the abbasid empire overwhelming the sultanate of delhi um, as well as the sultanate of uh, rum which is in modern day turkey which if you hadn't drawn the connection yet the turkic people would eventually take all that and yes they would eventually take over the byzantine empire and rename re basically would be renamed as the ottoman empire in the city of constantinople that becomes this but that comes a bit later. Um, the people who would overwhelm the Abbasid Empire would be the Saljuk Turks, which were one of many Turkish type of people. They lived um, on the border of the Abbasid Empire, as we saw on the previous map. There it is, right, kind of on the border here. Um, and oftentimes the Abbasid Empire would employ these Seljuk Turks to fight for them, but in, in the end that ended up being their undoing in that the Turks learned how to fight and then learned how to fight against the Abbasid. Um, they would come to dominate the Abbasid caliphs, and um, the main leader, Tugril Beg, um, was recognized as a sultan within the Abbasid Empire in 1055. There's a rather crude picture of him, but it's 11th century, so that's about the best as they could do in Central Asia. Um, he consolidated a hold on the major city of Baghdad, which is in modern-day Iraq, and was able to extend rule in the other parts of the empire. He didn't take over all of the Abbasid Empire, but basically was a huge part of it, pretty much by force. Um, but thanks to his leadership, um, he basically did become the power behind the throne and the Abbasid caliphs were more figureheads than they were actual leaders. They may have been the ones giving the decrees and the fancy speeches, but in terms of who told them what to do, that was guys like Tugril Beg, who was a Turk and not a um, Arabian Muslim. And eventually they would overwhelm the Byzantine Empire. Um, the Byzantine army was uh, defeated by uh, Seljuk Turks as early as 1071, and the emperor was taken captive, but they didn't quite have the capability to completely overtake the Byzantines yet. Um, there were large-scale and uh, invasions of Anatolia, and much of that did convert to Islam, but eventually Constantinople would be conquered by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, which had a pretty huge after effects for the way Europe would shape out, the way the Middle East would shape out, the way the world would shape out. Some argue that 1453 might even be a more important date than 1492 when Columbus and his crew, you know the rest. So there are many types of Turks. Um, there's Ghaznavid Turks who kind of ruled the northern part of what is now India. Um, they kind of started in Afghanistan and kind of the same thing as the Seljuk Turks. They sort of migrated down, overwhelmed the Sultanate of Delhi, um, 
first they just kind of went and just stole stuff and left. That's what we call plundering. And later they ruled. Um, Northern India was completely dominated by these people um, by the 13th century, and they were very intolerant towards religion. Um, they persecuted Buddhists, they persecuted Hindus, um, and sort of imposed their own sort of cultural norms. Basically, they just saw those sorts of people as threats to them. Needless to say, they were not extraordinarily well received by uh, the Indians whom they plundered and persecuted and more or less made their lives miserable. Now, we enter one of the more famous characters in world history, Genghis Khan. A lot of people call him Genghis Khan, but I, I don't really care what you call him. He's very dead, so he's not going to be too offended. But technically, the proper pronunciation of his name is Genghis Khan. Genghis. Kind of like a mixture of a ch and a j sound. Genghis. Um, though his actual name was Temujin. That's what his birth name was, but he adopted the name Genghis Khan, which means universal ruler. So needless to say, he did pretty well for himself. Um, he was born into a noble family. His father was a very prominent warrior, but he fell out of favor with the other various Mongolian nobles, was poisoned to death, and Temujin's family was forced into poverty where he grew up very, very poor. But he also grew up very, very brutal. There's thing about Genghis Khan is that much of his family background is more lore than fact, but that's about all we have. Supposedly, he killed his own brother because Genghis Khan brought home some fish to feed his family, and the brother took it all, and so he waited until his brother was just minding his business and shot him to death with an arrow. That aside... He was very, very powerful in terms of being a military leader and in terms of being a political leader, in terms of being able to forge alliances. Um, he was able to bring Mongolian tribes together into one confederation and begin his massive, ambitious project for pretty much world domination and is still one of the most famous world figures we have ever seen. Um, he was an extraordinarily brutal person, um, and it goes to show the sort of healing effects of time on one's reputation because when you consider the amount of people he killed the amount of women he raped he's definitely one of the worst most brutal people ever one could even make a case of him being in the same conversation as like an adolf hitler but he's long since dead and it's so old that it's almost fictional in terms of his exploits but we have to keep in mind the type of person we're dealing with and be careful not to romanticize kind of who he is and sort of keep in mind who these people actually were. But in terms of his political organization, um, he broke up the tribal organization and had everybody loyal to him. He forged military units for men of different tribes and if you did your job and you did it well, you were in Chinggis Khan's good graces. If not, you're very likely going to die. He established a capital in um, the Mongolian city of Karakorum and sort of expanded from there. Um, the population of Mongolia was only 1 million, uh, less than 1% of the Chinese population, so not very big, but their army was pretty much everybody. And a lot of times when they attacked, you either had a choice of joining them or dying them. Again, as I said before, they had a brilliant cavalry, short, manageable bows with which to fire projectiles, which allowed them minimal damage, which they could inflict supreme damage on their enemies. And... They were very adept when they traveled around at just completely slaughtering in the most brutal ways imaginable those who resisted them. However, if you just surrendered and let the Mongols have what they wanted, they treated you very, very, very well. They were very kind and very generous with those who surrendered. But those who resisted extreme cruelties, the likes of which the world has not seen very often, thank goodness. And if it sounds familiar, it should, because that's basically the same thing Alexander the Great did. Um, if you were on, if you surrendered, Alexander the Great would just leave you alone, just pay your tribute, maybe give him some and his army some provisions and presents and whatnot, and you're okay. Same thing with the Mongolians. But if you try to resist, you're likely a, you're likely to suffer a very long, very painful, and usually very public death. Because the more people knew how cruel these people could be, the more likely they were able to surrender and hopefully get the carrot rather than the stick.
so in terms of what they conquered, they conquered just about everything in Eurasia except for Japan and except for all of India and except for Europe, which is notable. We'll get into that. Um, but they conquered northern China in 1220. They conquered Afghanistan and Persia, Persia being a rather significant conquest because they're a rather well-developed and well-protected civilization. Um, basically, Chinggis Khan was very, very prone to revenge. Um, he sent his envoys to Khwarazm um, to basically get the Shah there to join him. Um, needless to say, the Shah resisted, had the envoys murdered in the following year. Genghis Khan basically chased the Shah all over the earth till the Shah died, and he ravaged the lands from which the Shah was uh, living so that future generations could never ever be able to replenish themselves. Um, Genghis Khan was notable in that he would do things like put salt in the earth because when you put salt in the earth, nothing can grow from that. And he would also um, basically go to a city, um, this was no exception, and he would basically line everybody up and if anybody was over three feet tall they would have their head cut off um basically that if you were anything older than probably a toddler you were going to die um and that's basically to prevent any sort of future rebellions within his empire um it was very devastating it was extremely destructive it was extremely just brutal and excruciating but it did have its purpose and he was able to amass an empire which covered just a huge amount of territory. Um, empire builders and conquerors would just, you know, relish at the thought of having something this big. Which gets us to wonder, how did he control this big area? Well, he kind of divided into four different territories and put his various closest generals in charge of it. Um, we have the Khanate of the Great Khan. This is kind of the, the jewel of the Mongolian Empire. That would be China, Korea, and obviously Mongolia. We have the Khanate of the Golden Horde, which I think sounds like the coolest one, but that includes the northern steppe region as well as parts of Eastern Europe, including modern-day Russia. We have the Ilkhanate of Persia, which is basically, obviously, um, Persia and, and Mesopotamia. And then we also have the Khanate of Chagatai, which is basically Afghanistan, Tibet, and just the areas north of India. Never quite conquered India, though. Difficult place to conquer. But eventually, Genghis Khan passes away. Um, and he leaves his empire to a couple of his children. They eventually pass away. And the next great leader of the Khanate is Kublai Khan, who is this sort of bearded, baby looking guy here doesn't look like much but again we got to consider that this is a very old painting and uh he was allowed to rule china he was a ruthless warrior but very religiously tolerant and he would establish a new chinese dynasty called the yuan dynasty um, which was one of two foreign ruled dynasties within china's history the other being the manchu dynasty aka the king dynasty which we'll look at later um, he tried unsuccessfully to expand his khanate into vietnam cambodia burma and java um, wouldn't be the first guy to try to go into vietnam and take it over and fail definitely wouldn't be the last um and he tried to take over japan twice amassed these huge navies to go in japan to take it but was turned back by um typhoons which are essentially hurricanes but in the other hemisphere and those would come to be called the kamikaze or divine winds and remember that name because we will see that again in world war ii this idea of a divine wind saving japan that brings us to the golden horde um now and earlier we saw the image of the Russian nobles getting crushed to death under Mongolian partying, but that was part of this conquest of Russia. Um, after China had been taken over, um, the Mongolians focused their attention towards basically Europe and began to take over parts. They established tributary relationships. They didn't quite take over like they did in China. They basically said, okay, well, we are in charge, but you guys can still run your thing. Just make sure you pay your tribute. And so you just had to pay this super hefty tax to the Mongolians. Your reward for doing so is they wouldn't come in and kill you and slaughter you in most very brutal and nasty ways. 
Um, and it's interesting to note that the Mongolian leader Batu had set his sights on conquering Western Europe and making his way down to Italy and France and amassing his army and maybe taking over Western Europe. But he stopped because Genghis Khan's successor and supposedly favorite son, Ogadai, passed away in Mongolia, and Batu had to basically take a trip over to uh, the capital city of Karakorum, and by the time he got back, got to remember this is horseback back then, and so by the time he got back, it was a year later, the armies weren't organized enough, they couldn't take over Western Europe, and that plan was essentially abandoned, but who knows how much world history would have changed had Ogadai not died or had Batu decided, I don't need to go to that funeral. I'll just continue my campaign into Western Europe. Could be a very different world now. And that brings us to the Ilkhanate of Persia. Um, the Abbasid Empire was toppled by a guy named Hulegu, um, who was Kublai Khan's brother, um, Baghdad, the main city of Persia, was sacked in 1258. Over 200,000 people were massacred. I mean, that's just a staggering number, especially back then when they're doing it with swords and arrows. That's a lot of people getting slashed. And it's important to remember that the Mongolians, though they were a remarkable civilization. They're also a very brutal one, but they definitely weren't the first. The Romans were incredibly brutal. The Greeks under Alexander the Great, also very brutal, and they certainly won't be the last brutal force. Um, this image down here is Hulegu basically forcing a patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church into captivity so he can't get up to any um, nefarious activities that might mess up what the Ilkhanate is trying to do. And in terms of Persia, they were very similar to um, the Golden Horde in that they allowed sort of the pre-existing Persian administration to run their to run their um, areas. And you have to remember, this is the land of uh, satraps in which they had pretty clear administration in terms of how to collect taxes and run their country. So they just kind of let them do it. Um, but it wasn't without growing pains. The Mongolians were great at conquering, not so good at administering sedentary societies and they did lose a lot of control right away you can't just be riding around on horses killing people all the time there's just not enough horses to do that so they sort of left the persians rule themselves as long as you pay your taxes to the mongolian empire you're good eventually the mongolians would at least the ones living in Persia, assimilate into a more islamic lifestyle and essentially adopt an islamic way of life but that took centuries and a long time to happen. Um, as for China, things worked out a little bit differently. They tried to have a strict separation from the Chinese. They outlawed marrying Chinese. They outlawed the Chinese to even learn the Mongolian language so that they could speak in secret more or less. But still, Mongolians, not good administrators. They were not good at running countries. So they imported other administrators, administrators from other uh, areas of the world, in particular Arabs and Persians, who thanks to the Islamic and Persian empires had a lot of experience and expertise and knowledge in that. And they even took a few European Christians, um, Marco Polo being the famous example of perhaps being a an administrator within the uh, Mongolian Empire within China, within the Yuan Empire. Though there's a lot of controversy with the legitimacy of Marco Polo's testimony. Um, supposedly, it all comes from the testimony of a person who claimed to know Marco Polo or claimed to say he was Marco Polo, who was rotting in a Genoese or um, it was either a Genoese or a Milan jail cell. And so some people question the legitimacy of the man's claims. But nonetheless, um, going back to Mongol rule, um, much more tolerant of religious freedoms, but very, very intolerant of anybody sort of infiltrating the Mongol political hierarchy. In terms of Buddhism, the Mongols had a special relationship. Um, shamanism remained very popular, but the Buddhists were rather shrewd in that they were able to sort of fine-tune their religion to gain Mongol support. Um, they basically claimed that the Khans were incarnations of the Buddha, so enlightened beings, so to speak, um, and they 
imported elements of shamanism within their um, style of Buddhism. Um, the Lamaist school is the um, particular sect of Buddhism in which the Dalai Lama, he's the 14th one, is in charge of. Um, it is a Basically, he is the most enlightened of these people, and he is the one in charge. When he dies, um, he will be reincarnated as someone else, and they'll decide who that is, and he will be the leader. He's one of the leading religious figures in the world. Um, if you ever need some uplifting messages in the morning, he has a pretty good Twitter for that. Um, but anyway... Um, the Mongolians obviously ruled this massive territory in that, though it was brutally taken, um, it did have some positives to it. Um, it allowed for those traveling within these areas to travel with pretty much freedom from any sort of danger. Um, some people refer to this period as the Pax Mongolica, which is obviously a appropriation of Pax Romana. Some people nowadays say the United States is the Pax Americana and that we make things safe for travel everywhere. Um, but trade across Asia increased huge, big time during this period because the Mongols kept you safe. You weren't going to cross them because if you did, you got to deal with the likes of Genghis Khan and his guys. Um, Diplomatic missions were protected, so if the leader of the Byzantine Empire wanted to have words with the Mongolian leader, he could send envoys there, and they won't be messed with to and from there. <coughs> and the Mongols were good about allowing people to resettle as long as they didn't cross them. So the Mongols are very much a type of people who would conquer you and then kind of leave you alone as long as you didn't cause them any problems. Um, in terms of their decline, however, the Mongols declined in two areas. They declined in Persia, mostly due to poor financing and poor administration of the government there. Um, they spent too much than they collected in taxes, a classic problem. And to sort of make up for that, they kept taxing the peasantry. Peasantry couldn't pay for it. Peasantry gets mad. They overthrow the people in charge. They tried to replace the metal currency, like gold and silver and that sort of thing, with a paper currency, but it failed. People were just not ready to use paper notes as a way of um, paying for things. They didn't have value in it. And remember, the only thing that makes money valuable is people trust, people's trust that it's valuable. There was infighting within Persia. The last Ilkhan died without an heir in 1335, and Mongol rule collapsed, and essentially it reverted back to the various Islamic people in charge of that. Um, The Yuan dynasty also declined, um, sort of the same thing. Um, people, tr they tried to use a paper currency, didn't work. People lost confidence in it as a way to sort of make the economy a little bit more stable. Prices rose, and in order to sort of counteract against the government, basically the people stopped using the currency and shut down their businesses altogether, and that was just sort of, the beginning of the end. There were major power struggles within the Yuan administration, and sort of the last straw, so to speak, was the bubonic plague, which we'll get to in Europe in chapter 19. But if you remember the dynastic cycle, once you start having crises, once you start having food shortages, once you start having epidemic diseases, that's the sign that you have lost the mandate of heaven. And then you start peasant rebellions, and we start a new dynastic cycle shortly thereafter. So, two elements of Genghis Khan's empire, gone. The Great Khanate, gone. The Ilkhanate, gone. But we do have two Khanates that were able to survive. Um, the Khanate of Chagatai in Central Asia, which continued to threaten China in terms of various attacks and raids, and the Golden Horde in the, Golden Horde in the Caucasus Mountains and the steppe region in the mid-16th century, which always seemed to threaten Russia in terms of taking over territories. They were always a headache for the Russian um, kingdom that was emerging at this time. Now, with the 
powerful Mongols kind of out of the way that left it wide open for other Turkic Mongolian leaders to emerge. And this is where we see the emergence of Tamerlane, who was actually named Timur the Lame. He walked with a limp because he was injured as a young person. Um, he was very similar to Genghis Khan. He eliminated his rivals to power or Bey was able to get people to back him. Um, and he was very, very skilled in terms of military campaigning. He built his capital in Samarkand, um, which is basically kind of in modern day either Afghanistan or Pakistan, one of the two. My cursory knowledge of the border between those two countries is probably not as good as it ought to be. Um, but he was the major leader. Um, he was sort of the heir, so to speak, to the um, Mongolian Khans. Um, ruled a very large area in the 15th century um, and was not able to maintain it because he died and didn't really have quite the most capable heirs to take control of it. Again, much like the Mongolians, not very organized in terms of a governing structure. Um, the power struggles would divide up the Timurid Empire into four regions, but would eventually mold into new regions, aka the Mughal Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. So we see this sort of theme of large Eurasian empires falling apart into sections. We see with Alexander the Great when he had his you know, Seleucid um, area, the Ptolemaic area, and so forth. We see it with Mongolia. Now we see it with Timur the Lame's areas as well. So sort of it breaking into pieces. And from this, we have the foundation of the Ottoman Empire, which was founded by a guy named Osman, a charismatic leader who dominated a part of Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey. He declared independence from his Seljuk Sultan in 1299 and began to attack the Byzantine Empire. And those who followed him were known as Os Osmanlis, or if you sort of say it, or Osmanlis, 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 those are Ottomans, sort of this sort of name shift, so to speak. And the Ottoman conquests were primarily in what is now Turkey and southeastern Europe. Um, a lot of people supported them because they were not happy with the sort of decaying Byzantine rule where you had to pay a whole lot of taxes and didn't really get a whole lot in return. Yeah, the Hagia Sophia is great, but if you're living in modern day Greece, you're probably never going to see it and it doesn't really do much for you. It's just might as well be fiction, might as well be Oz or something like that. And interestingly enough, Tamerlane um, defeated the Ottomans, even though like they kind of emerged from him later on. Um, but the Ottomans recovered in the 1440s and eventually would rule this area well and well, basically up until World War I. So a very long, long, long time. And then it gets us to one of our last slides. Um, Sultan Mehmed, one of the um, Turkish people, a uh, member of the Ottomans, um, sacked and conquered the city of Constantinople in 1453, the last Rome, so to speak. He would rename it Istanbul, hence the song Istanbul was Constantinople. Um, it would become the capital of the Ottoman Empire, which would be a very large empire, um, kind of taking taking the veins of um, taking the reins of not only the Byzantine but also the um, Islamic Empire as well. Um, they absorbed the remainder of the Byzantine Empire and adopted some of their customs and would continue to expand into the the Levant, which is the area of Palestine, and would expand into northern Africa. Okay, and that's the last of the slide. Um, hopefully you found this useful and uh, make sure you're keeping up with reading the chapter. Have a great day. Try to do something healthy. Maybe some push-ups, maybe some jumping jacks, maybe some sit-ups, or do whatever you want. But whatever you're going to do, do it the best you can.